1904, there was no Ukrainian political map of Europe. Still, exactly in this year, 1904, Mikhail Groshevsky, probably the biggest Ukrainian historian ever, at that time professor of history at the Lviv or Lemberg University, published his programmatic article. He did it in Ukrainian language, but in a publication of the Russian Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg. And this article was a suggestion, it was a short text, a suggestion to rethink or to rationalize, that's Kroshevsky's own word, the existing scheme of the history of East Slavic people. Kroshevsky's idea and proposal was to emancipate Ukrainian and Belarusian national histories from the Russian or Great Russian One. And then later on he tried to promote his point in numerous other books, including his monumental History of Ukraine, Rus. That's actually telling that here Rus is included into title. Grushevsky was a national historian and he believed in national history. Sometime afterwards, when the Soviet Union collapsed and Ukraine became independent, in 1995, Slavic Review, the leading American journal in East European studies, initiated a discussion around a provocative piece written by Mark von Hagen, a brilliant American scholar, with a highly provocative and interesting title, Does Ukraine Have a History? In this article, Mark at first described the existing situation in the field of Ukrainian studies in the so-called Western world, and then secondly suggested how this field could be reinvented for the sake of Ukrainian studies and for the sake of international history, if you wish. So, von Hagen's suggestions was that Ukrainian history, that's a quote, can serve as a wonderful vehicle to challenge the nation-state's conceptual hegemony and to explore some of the most contested issues of identity formation, cultural construction and maintenance, and colonial institutions and structures. It is actually amazing that von Hagen was not the first who made such a claim, but of course he was the first to do it in early 90s in English language context. But if you look back at the history of Ukrainian history writing, then we'll find out that already in 1946, right after the Second World War, Boris Krupnitsky, one of the leading Ukrainian diaspora historians who lived in West Germany at the moment, published a number of very interesting theoretical, methodological texts on Ukrainian history. And actually Krupnitsky was one of a few, maybe even the only one, uh, Ukrainian diaspora scholar of the time, deeply interested in ongoing theoretical debates in the European historiography of his age. And what Krupnitsky wrote in one of his texts, let's listen to this quote as well. It is dangerous that Ukrainian historians both in Soviet Ukraine and in emigration, did not step out of a certain kind of local history, Krajeznavstvo. We need to take on European and world problems by integrating Ukrainian topics into this broad process. Otherwise, we will remain a forgotten country. It is actually interesting if you go back to Mark von Hagen's article on his discussion, that in one of the replies to uh, Mark's text, Serhii Pohi spoke about the probability of the establishment of the new chairs of Ukrainian studies in Germany. And in 20 years that came true. And actually our lecture course this semester is designed to reflect on the analytical perspectives of the entangled history of Ukraine. That's the name of our chair. The first and the only professorship in Germany with history of Ukraine in its title. So, how to conceptualize Ukrainian studies? What actually are we talking about? What do we mean by speaking about Ukrainian history or history of Ukraine? Is it reserved or should it be reserved for ethnic Ukrainians? Should it be focused on the dynamic discussion of what does Ukraine and Ukrainians meant in different historical time periods? Should it be focused on Ukrainian territory? Maybe in the present-day borders of Ukraine, maybe in some other time period? Actually, that's a set of a very important, I would say, crucial questions. And I'd like to remind you that the founder of the Harvard Miracle, the professor at the Harvard University, Omelian Pritsak, 
who was a Ukrainian American scholar, also a trichologist. And his very interesting article called What Ukrainian History is About, written in 1991, spoke attention. All processes of ethnically non-Ukrainian state structures need to be studied objectively along with ethnically Ukrainian states so that the Crimean Tatars, for example, will not be presented as wild, anxious and robbers, but at the same level with the Cossacks as our ancestors. Here, Pritzak actually referred to very popular, very influential metaphor notion of Ukraine between East and West, also in a changing way, changing nature of East and West. Uh, predominantly, it was about the so-called Eastern Bulwark or Eastern Wall between the so-called European civilization and the Islamic world. In the case of Ukrainian history, it was the story between the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Ukrainian Cossacks on the one side, and the Ottoman Empire and the Crimean Hanet on the other. Christianity and Islam. But could we reduce, as it was done unfortunately many times, those complex relationships to the idea of the war, or bombwork, or conflict, or competition even? I'd like to mention that already in the 1920s, we could find important historiographical suggestions made by Ukrainian historians that the entire complex relationship between Ukraine and the East, meaning Islamic world, should be uh, rethink in a new way. And even if you go deeper into the old Rus history, into the history of interaction between uh, the Kievan principality and other Orthodox principalities and their nomadic neighbors, so-called wild steppe, we'll see as Volodymyr Parchomenko, one of the leading and forgotten Ukrainian historians of the 1920s, said that actually the complex relationship between the Rus and the steppe, all types of wars, but also marriages, cultural interactions, trade, could be conceptualized this way, one sentence, the reconciliation between East and West gives a particular taste and meaning to the life of Kievan Rus. Now, of course, East and West could also be understood and read in terms of Western Europe versus Eastern Europe, Poland versus Russia. And uh, last but not least, West Christianity, Rome versus East Christianity, Constantinople, Byzantium, let me remind you that, of course, the old Rus, Prince Volodymyr, as his name was written in the Chronicle, he decided to be baptized. He was baptized from Constantinople, so from the eastern center of Christianity. And, for instance, um, uh, his neighboring country, uh, the Principality of Polans, known as Poland, uh, received or gained their Christianity from Rome. It's actually interesting that one of the best books about this competition between the Eastern and the Western Christianity over Ukraine is this one, let me show it to you, by Eduard Winter, written in German language. And what's actually amazing and interesting and provoking that this very important scientific publication came out in the year of, maybe you could see it, of 1942 in Leipzig, so in the Nazi Germany, in the Third Reich. And that's also a very important example for all of us, how should we read different books and sources, how we need to contextualize them, to put them also in the uh, proper context of the time of their publication and acceptance or non-acceptance by the academic community. In other words, Ukraine was always, not always, but very often defined or presented in terms of uh, this, again, this competition between East and West, as the apple of discord between two big civilizational projects, as the main battlefield. And if you look at the 20th century, again, after the number of Ukrainian statehood projects, all of them failed in 1970 and 1921, we have then the emergence of the Soviet Ukraine, we have some parts of Ukraine um, integrated into the interwar Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania. And, but what's interesting here? It's interesting that uh, recently 
a number of important scholars, first and foremost Timothy Snyder, suggested to look at the entire 20th century uh, as a century of um, severe struggle where Ukraine was actually again like the main battlefield. And that is why this very popular and famous notion of bloodlines came to being. But what I'd like to stress here that Ukrainian 20th century or Ukrainian past is not just bloodlines and not just about contests, competitions and wars. Uh, what is also important that cultural subjectivity of Ukraine, that it was not just an object of imperial powers um, struggle, it has a cultural subjectivity of its own, and this subjectivity could not be reserved to just one particular ethnic or religious group. In other words, if we think about entangled history of Ukraine, we should think and we should include into our thinking such personalities as Olga Kobulanska and Lysi Ukrainka, as Isaac Babel and Josef Roth, as Sergei Prokofiev and Karol Shemanovsky, as Kazimir Malevich and Alexander Archipenko, Alexander Dovzhenko and Sergei Parajanov, and many, many others. Another, again, like, once again, we consider at the Viadrina Ukrainian studies as a field with numerous entanglements with Jewish, Ottoman, Polish, Russian, and Soviet history. And actually, we look at the Ukrainian history in this respect as a possibility to enrich all the spheres of knowledge mentioned uh, previously, but also to look at complex, controversial and astonishing Ukrainian history as a key to a number of challenging questions, not just in Eastern European, but in trans-regional and transnational context. The aim of this course is not just to introduce various ways in which Ukrainian history could be written or have had been written, but also to pose a number of research questions, like, for instance, how Holodomor, the Great Famine of 1932-33 in Soviet Ukraine, could be integrated into the context of Eurasian politics studies. How colonialism issues, Russian, German, Polish, in Eastern Europe, could be applied to Ukrainian case, and do we have any possibilities of post-colonial approaches? What does new imperial history as a dynamic field of research with its primarily interdisciplinary attention on imperial situation could give us when it comes to the numerous issues of Ukrainian Cossacks integration into the Russian Empire, to the broad variety of Ukrainian-Russian relations, the number of strategies of imperial strategies and also anti-imperial, non-imperial strategies on this territory throughout the modern uh, time. So, welcome, and let's think about all those issues together.